Now we're glad that you are here today, and if you are online and listening, we welcome you. Glad that you have joined us. Now we're going to uh, read some scriptures as we go through my little message, and uh, so I'm just going to sort of set the stage. And maybe some of you have seen a rose like this. I love roses. They're beautiful. And uh, most of the time, unless you buy them at Walmart, they smell really good. And the reason I say that is because they don't seem to have much smell at all, some of the roses that you buy. But this is one, and it is called the Peace Rose. Those are the colors. It was designed that way, and they're able to design things scientifically and make the kind and the color of roses that they like. Now, uh, this uh, predates most, uh, well, a lot of you that are here today, but um, I'm not sure if anyone noticed, but just a few days ago, the 15th of August actually is when it started, but uh, there was this, this thing, I'll call it a thing. It was a big, 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 huge concert, hundreds of thousands of people, and they called it Woodstock. And there was a whole bunch of goings on, I'll leave it at that, okay? And uh, at that time, there were sort of some of these, uh, these um, symbols that were used, one that looks something like that. Actually, what it is, it's an up, di- upside down cross with the arms broken on it. That's really what the design is. But that was, that was and really has continued to be a peace symbol. Back in those days and for years after that, people would say, peace, 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 brother. They would go around and say that, you know. And um, it was, everyone talked about peace. Uh, Not only did people talk about it, but they wrote about it. And uh, those are just a few of the examples up there by different authors. And you can see the quest for peace. And what that means, that word quest, is the, the search or the hunt to find peace. Really down inside of every one of us, God has built it in us. He wants us to have peace with him. And so people hunt for it, but as they say, they look for it in all the wrong places. And a lot of these books uh, talk about different ways in which people have searched for peace. A lot of times when people are being interviewed for whatever the case may be, um, and they're asked, what are their goals? My goals are for world peace, peace on earth, world peace, And that's sort of a noble idea, a noble uh, um, goal, I suppose. But you see, there isn't any peace on earth. There isn't peace on earth, naturally speaking. There is only trouble. And I think all of you know about that. Um, Sometimes people think, well, if if I confess my sins, then I will have peace. And really what confession is... It's telling God, or somebody, but in our case, as we're looking at it, it's telling somebody, God, who already knows. Telling him what he already knows. Sometimes people think, well, if I, if I confess my sins, then somehow or another I will have peace. I think I've mentioned before, a long time ago, but back in 1994, a man by the name of John Dennison and I were down in the city of Hickory, or Hickory, as they say down there, Hickory, North Carolina. And uh, we were asked to go visit a young woman. She was about 28 years old. Her name was Elise. And the reason we got called was the doctor had just been there. She was very, very sick. She had cancer. And the doctor had just been there and told her and told the family, she has two hours to live. And so we got a call, would you come and visit Elise? She's really scared. And uh, could you come and visit? So um, we, we made our way to her house. And uh, as you know, I have seen a lot of people very, very sick over the years. And Elise was, uh, she was skin and bones. She was so thin. She was so wasted by her disease and her cancer that uh, there was hardly anything to her. So we went in and introduced ourselves. She had never met us before. And she said this. We asked her, what can we do for you? She said, I've asked my pastor to come and visit me. And he told me to confess my sins and everything would be okay when I die. And she said, I've confessed my sins 
a thousand times, why don't I have any peace? Now, peace isn't just a good feeling. All right? Sometimes that's what people think about when they think about peace. Peace is really knowing everything is okay. But when it comes to this confession, does that pay? Does me telling somebody what I've done, does that pay for the sin? What do you think? Does that pay for it? No, it doesn't. It absolutely does not. If I had committed a crime, if I had murdered somebody, and I was in a court, and I said to the judge, Your Honor, I confess, I killed him. Does that make it okay? Does it make it okay? No, it does not. There has to be, excuse me, there has to be payment for the crime. Confession is simply telling the judge or the jury or God what he already knows. Now, just imagine this. This is something that maybe some of you can relate to. Uh, The idea of you owing money or someone owing money to you. Now, whoever designed this this, uh, slide, I'm not sure who it was, but uh, they put this is like uh, all these sticks of dynamite and a clock that's ticking. The idea is that when somebody owes someone money or someone says, you know what, you owe me money, and the problem gets worse and worse, and a lot of times it ends up in an explosion. Not with dynamite necessarily, but there's a problem there. And I'm just using this problem as an example. Now, here's uh, here's two young ladies. And you can tell by looking at that, they're, they're best of friends. They might even be related. I don't really know. But I just want you to think of it this way, because I want to bring this over to the idea of the gospel that we are seeking to present to you. You see, what happens is, one of them, her, owes this one money. One of them owes money. And it's almost like that thing, that money, is dividing them. It comes between the two of them. On one side, there's someone who's very sad. The other side, there's someone who's very angry, very upset. And now they're not friends. Now there's a separation because somebody owes somebody else something. And that's the way it is with us. We're going to learn in just a minute. We owe God because of what we have done, because of our sin. We owe Him. And because of that, there's a separation. So let's look at them again. What? I owe you money? Because of what is owed, because of this problem that exists, there's a separation. But if there's money that's paid, if the payment is made, the problem goes away and the two of them can be back together again. Now, most of you, I think, have seen this slide before. And you could probably tell me what's coming next, and it's this. That sin, every single time, always, sin separates between us and God. One day in the life of the Lord Jesus, he was having supper at someone's house. He was having supper at this person's house. That person's name was Simon. And uh, you say, he was having supper? It looks like he's lying in his bed. Well, that's how they ate supper. That's how they ate their meals. They didn't sit in a chair. They reclined at the table. It was sort sort of like a couch, sort of like a mattress kind of a thing. And everyone, they had their heads towards the table and their feet were back that way, and that's the way it was all the way around the table. Now, when he was there, there was this woman who came in, and she had some very, very expensive ointment. Very expensive. And uh, you can sort of see, maybe you can see there, but she's weeping. She's crying. She never said a word. Not a word. But she came to the Lord Jesus, and uh, while he is there at supper time, um, her tears literally drenched the feet of the Lord Jesus. And she put ointment, that special costly ointment, on his feet. And then she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, this man here, Simon, he's thinking to himself, if, if Jesus, if this man knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch her. Touch her. So, Jesus knew what he was thinking. And so he said, Simon, I'm going to tell you a little story. 
I want to tell you a little story. The little story is about this man and these two guys. These two fellows owed him money. There's, there's what I was talking about before. They owed him money. In fact, this guy here, in today's dollars, based on an average income in the United States, he owes him $90,500. Almost $100,000. And this other fellow, about one-tenth of that amount, he owes him over $9,000. And when those fellows reached into their pocket to pull out their wallet or pull out their, their money clip, there was nothing there. They had nothing to pay. Now Jesus is telling this story to this man, Simon, who's looking down his nose at this woman. He said if, she, if he knew, the Lord Jesus knew what kind of sinner she was. You know what happened? What happened was this. This man... Who, owed, who was owed all this money by these two fellows. See what he's doing right there? What he's doing is he's, he's tearing up the debt. He's erasing the debt so that there is no more debt. In other words, he says to these guys, one guy owes 90000 the other guy owes 9000 He says, I forgive you of your debt. No more debt. You don't owe me anything anymore. You say, wow, that was really nice of him. But you have to remember that the man who forgave, the man who forgave those other two fellows, it cost him all that money. He's the one that had to pay that money for whatever the reason was. He couldn't pay, so I'll pay. He couldn't pay, so I'll pay. And he did. And those fellows, that's why that picture back here, they're going out with smiles on their faces, aren't they? Because they weren't required to pay and they weren't punished for what they owed. The debt was erased. And then going back to this woman, he's talking to Simon about this woman. And he said, uh, he said, you know what? Her sins, which are many, he knew all about her sins. He knew how bad her sins were. He knows how bad your sins are. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. She loves much. The reason she came in there was to tell him she loved him. And she gave that expensive ointment and the tears so that, she, so that she could express her gratitude. So this idea of peace, what it really means is, I'm just going to look at this one, an agreement or a treaty to end problems. In other words, there's nothing between us. So I said, I said um, peace isn't really a feeling. It's simply knowing everything's okay between us. We're at peace. Sometimes when there's a battle, uh, people talk about terms of peace. In other words, in order for there to be peace, this is what has to happen. You have to do this and this and this, and then there will be peace between us. That's what God says to you, and God says to me. In order for there to be peace between us, because He wants us to have peace, He wants there to be peace between us, He doesn't want that separation to exist. He says this and this and this have to happen. Question. If you knew, if you knew you had to meet God before today was over, would everything be okay between you and God? Would you be at peace with God? See, there's a problem for our peace, and uh, the problem is this, and we've mentioned it. It says we're enemies, Romans chapter 5. It also says that we are enemies in our mind by wicked works. In Colossians in chapter 1, we're enemies of God. And enemies aren't at peace, are they? See, when they give up, when they surrender, then they can be at peace. But an enemy is contrary to whoever. And because of our sins, because of these wicked works, our sins, we are enemies with God. The issue is our sin. And I am sure that sometimes... Uh, when you listen to the gospel, you wonder yourselves, like, why do we always talk about sin? The reason we do is because if there was no sin, if you didn't have to face your sin, if I didn't have to face my sin, then we would never have to have had a cross. Jesus would never have had to die at that cross. This is what the Lord wants. This is what He wants of us. But because of our sin, 
It can't happen. We're banished. We're separated from God. Separated from God. And you know what? God is just and God is holy. But I believe, and I think I could show that by principle at the very least, that God is grieved in his heart. It makes him... The Lord Jesus wept in John chapter 11, verse 35. He wept because he saw what sin was doing. He wept over the earth. He wept over the city. He cried. He didn't want there to be the problems and the issues. So people that... um, People that want peace, and inside there's this longing for this peace. Um, they they go in for it. They they go they go after peace. Now, some of you might be familiar with a woman who is who has died, but her name is Mother Teresa. And if you've ever read anything about Mother Teresa, she was a woman who did this. She went in for anything and everything possible so that she could have peace. And she did it for years and years and years in her life. And she did many wonderful, good things. But let me tell you what she she said. One of the things that she said very, very near the time that she died. She said, I want God with all the power of my soul. And yet, between us, there is a terrible separation. That's after decades doing the best that she could, trying to help all kinds of people. But those things didn't answer. They didn't pay the debt. They didn't pay for the problem. So people try on their own. They try. It says, we look for peace, but no good came. Jeremiah chapter 8. That's what people try to do. We're trying to find peace. We're trying to fix the problem between ourselves and God. And no matter what we do, no matter how hard we chase after it, and probably no one in history chased after it more than this woman that I just quoted to you. You see, the problem is we can't do anything. We can do nothing to get peace with God. So the other part of it is God's part. God was, or he was through Christ, making it Better. He was reconciling, restoring this problem that existed. He was bringing it back together. But he could only do it, and he only did it through the Lord Jesus Christ. Question. Now, if you look at that boat, it's a boat I don't want to be on. But uh, because there's some heavy-duty water out there, heavy-duty storm that's out there. My question is, where should the anchor go? Because they need to throw out an anchor, or that boat is going to sink. So if we just put it right, right down inside the ship. Is that going to help? No. How about if we uh, we put her on the bow? Is that going to help? No. You see, the anchor needs to go where it can grab hold of something. This is an anchor that actually was left. It's a uh, sort of a, it's a rusted out thing. But you see the size of the anchor. You see that big hook. The idea is that down, way down in the water attached to the chain or attached to the rope that's attached to the boat, it grabs hold of something solid. It grabs hold of a great big rock. And that's why the Hebrew writer says, which hope we have, the hope that's in Christ, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I'm going to move on past this because I want to talk about the person of peace. You all know something, at least, of the Christmas story. And uh, you know that when... The Lord Jesus was about to come into the world, and long before he actually came into the world, there was a prophecy. Some 700 years or so before he actually came, this is what Isaiah wrote. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and one of his names is Prince of Paul, writing in the New Testament, says he himself, nobody else, it's very exclusive, nobody else except he himself, the Lord Jesus, he is our peace. And so those shepherds that day, that night, they got that message. They got that message from the angelic hosts, and the message was this, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, because the Prince of Peace 
was to be born into the world. Here's what Paul writes in in Romans chapter 5. Since we have been made right, justified, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way I can be at peace with God. Some people say things like, well, I've made my peace with God. No, they didn't. Because they can't. God's the one who was offended. God's the one against whom we have sinned. So God is the only one who can make the peace. And he did that through the Lord Jesus Christ. He did that through the cross on which the Lord Jesus suffered. He's the only go-between. He's the only mediator. Some of you have maybe heard of a, a famous preacher by the name of D.L. Moody. Mr. Moody, he traveled all over the world. And uh, he was visiting in a little town one day. And uh, he was talking to a a dad in in a home at that particular time. And um, when he got to the door of that house, he he said, the last house I was at, I had my umbrella and I left it at that house. And the little boy, he said, well, I'll go get it for you, Mr. Moody. And so he knew where the house was. So away he went. It was still raining a bit. But away he went. He got the umbrella and he brought it back. And on the way back, he, um, he tripped and he fell. And Mr. Moody's umbrella looked something like that. So he got to the house and he didn't come in the front door. He went in the back door. And he's trying to peek into where Mr. Moody and his dad are talking. Finally got his dad's eyes. So dad came back and he showed them the umbrella. He said, Dad, it was an accident. I didn't didn't mean to do it. And he said, I hope Mr. Moody isn't really, really upset at me. So he said to his dad, he said, Dad, would, would would you talk to him for me? So that's what the man did. That's what dad did. He went in and he explained what had happened. And Mr. Moody saw the boy and he said, come here, I want to talk to you. He said, oh, no. Mr. Moody said, were you afraid to talk to me directly? He said, so you wanted someone to go between, right? You wanted your dad to, to fix it for you. He said. And then he had the opportunity to tell him. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to fix it. Because we couldn't do anything. We were the one that had caused the problem. It was our sin, my sin, that had made a separation between us and God. And so Jesus came as the mediator. He was the person of peace. But that peace could not be bought. It could not be obtained. It couldn't be gotten cheaply. There was a price that had to be paid. We read these words in Ephesians 2. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, wait, that distance, that separation, are brought nigh, you brought near by the blood of Christ. And Colossians 1, having made peace through the blood of Christ. What a price to pay. So expensive. We saw between those two girls, there had to be cash. Once the cash was paid, the debt was gone. They didn't owe, she didn't owe the other one, and so they could be friends again. But because of our sin, our sin has been a a great debt, a great cost. But on the cross of Calvary, you remember that Jesus said it's finished, which means it is paid in full. Do you think, do you think if we paid enough money, we could have our sins forgiven? All the money in the world, trillions, would it take away one sin maybe? No. no, there was only one acceptable payment. And that payment was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. That situation that exists because of our sin, that separation that exists because of our sin, could only be remedied, could only be fixed by way of the cross. And the Lord Jesus, whose hands and feet were pierced, He wore a crown of thorns. His back was whipped. On the cross of Calvary, he suffered. He paid the price so that you and I could be brought back together again. 
So that re- there could be that reconciliation. Here's what John writes. He says, this is real love. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son, the satisfaction for our sins. Colossians chapter 2, he canceled that record. There's a record, like, here's what you owe me. He canceled it. How could God just say, it's okay, I forgive you? He says he forgave our sins. How could he do that? By the rest of the verse. He took it, those things that were charged against us. There's the charges. Like if you'd use a credit card, the charges. That's what you owe. He took that list of charges. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. Now, if I can have a couple more minutes, brother. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit of a story just to illustrate this, and I'll make it short um, because we're talking about the the price of our peace. And uh, there's there's a, there was a, a couple, Don and Carol Richardson, and Don and Carol Richardson, after, after they finished college and were married, um, they had a desire to take the gospel way, way, way over to a place called Irian Jaya. All right. You can see down here is Australia. It's way over there. It's in the islands. And uh, the people that they met there were very, very backward. These people had never seen metal tools. All of their axes and their hoes and all the tools they used were still stone. Like they were so backwards. They weren't connected to anywhere, anyone else in the whole world. They didn't know about all of these things. And so that's who they wanted to go and visit. Not only not only were, was this a problem, but they were headhunters. And I'm not going to go into any detail about that, but they were, you didn't want to be on the wrong side of them. Okay, or you would you would be lunch. Literally. Um, they all had their various forms of dress. But um, one of the things that they learned very quickly about this tribe, these group of people, was they thought that if you could trick somebody and be really nasty to them, that was a good thing. So they would try to tell the story of, of Jesus and the cross. And they would tell the story of Judas. Remember Judas came to Jesus in the garden and he kissed him. He says, he says, I'll give someone a kiss and he's the one I want you to arrest. And so, the, in fact, it's, it's, he said they, they would wait and, and their eyes would get real big when they were, t- they were telling the story because they couldn't wait till the story when Judas went and kissed him. And they would all say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, that's, that's the kind of attitude, the psyche that they had. They were sick people. They thought bad was good. And they practiced it. They had one fellow from one tribe, and they kept inviting him, come, come on. And they they kept making him feel really good about it. He thought he was was quite something. Until one day he was the main course. If you don't understand that, you can ask somebody later, okay? They killed him. And they thought that was great. So these, these missionaries are thinking, how can we... How can we bring the gospel to them? What happened one day was that the two sides, these tribes, and there were a number of tribes, but there were two tribes and they were fighting. And almost every day, one was killing someone from the other tribe. They were killing each other. And finally, Don Richardson, he called the chief and he said, look, he says, if you guys don't stop, he said, we're leaving. We're not going to stay here if you guys are going to keep doing this. And so this chief, the chieftain, he, he was very upset because, first of all, his, his wife, Carol, Carol Richardson, she had medical training, and so she helped take care of sick people in the tribe. And they were the ones that had, um, that had all the metal tools. No one, no one else, no other tribe had that. They didn't want to lose that. And not only that, but they were the only white people that were there. And so it sort of gave them uh, a notch above the rest of them, and they didn't want to lose that. So what they did was this. There, there were, you just have, this wasn't the tribes, I couldn't find a, a picture, but here's, here's one side, one tribe, imagine, and on this side is another tribe. This is, this is the side where the chief has been told, if you don't settle down, um, we're going to leave. So that young man, that chieftain, he said, I have to make peace for my tribe. For my people, I have to make peace. 
And so what he did, it was, it was very sad. What he did is he, he went over to his wife. And his wife had just very, very recently had given birth to their first child, their firstborn son. And he took that little baby out of, their, out of her arms. And she just, she just started to sob. And then what he did, he took, he took that little baby, just to give you an idea, he took that little baby and he went to each one in his tribe. He went down the line. He would go down the line. He'd hold his baby and every one of them would put their hands on him. He'd go on and put their hands on him, put their hands on him. And then when he was all done, he went over to the other side and he handed that baby to the other chief. And the other chief took that baby and he went down to each of those persons in that side and they put their hand on him and they put their hand on him until everyone had touched the child. That little child was called the peace child. And this was how they were able to bring the gospel to them because what they said was this, as long as that child lives, this army will never attack this army. Never. As long as the child is alive, they cannot attack each other. Well, you've seen pictures like this. There's a little baby. And this picture is to indicate that that is Jesus. And he is my peace. You know what's so wonderful? We don't have to worry about him. Not as long, we don't have to worry about him being alive because he is going to live forever. He will be the peace child. And he was able to bring the gospel to so many of those people. And they understood it. And they realized that God gave his peace child to us. And he will never die. And because of that, we can have peace with God. So I hope that this has been uh, helpful to you. And uh, remember, he alone is the one who is able to bring peace. So I'm going to uh, close in prayer, and then uh, Brother Frank will speak, and you can go to your classes. Lord, we are so thankful that he is the one that made peace for us. But, Father, it cost him his own blood. We're thankful for the sacrifice that he made, and we pray, Lord, that you would remember for each one that is here today, for those that are listening, we pray, O oh God, that they might understand the only way they can ever, ever, ever have peace with God, the only way that they can be brought near to God is through this one, having made peace by the blood of his cross. So bless your word. Bless and give help in the Sunday school. Bless and give help to Brother Frank as he would open the word of God and teach us. We ask your blessing upon us now, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.